Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff, and I'm here with Becky Chanel, Director of Chapel Street Kids, and we want to talk to you about something really important. Powerful moments often come from a simple yes, and today I'm inviting you to say yes. But this yes isn't a simple one. It comes with the great reward of seeing babies here for the first time, that they were created by God, or watching kids hear the story of God's amazing rescue plan, or walking alongside a Masterpiece family as we discover together how each person is uniquely created. It's one of my great joys to have a front row seat in what God is doing at Chapel Street Church. And we have more and more kids coming on Sunday mornings and to Adventure Club and Buddy Break. Week in and week out, we welcome new families. Maybe you don't see us in Action Weekly, but I want you to know that we have an incredible team of people who have said yes to pouring in to our littlest Chapel Streeters. But there's a need for more. We have some crucial roles that need to be filled. Across our four campuses, it takes 307 people to make up our full team team of servants and we don't want you to miss out on what God is doing in the lives of our Chapel Street kids. So I want to invite you, each of you, to answer this call. We need our Chapel Street family to step up. We need 140 more servants, 140 more people to say yes. You know, I've been here almost 25 years and my grown children grew up in this church. Many of you invested in their lives. And I think back on those days and I'm profoundly grateful for the impact, the mentoring, the challenging, the encouragement that was provided for them through our kids' ministries. And I think about the kids, as Becky said a moment ago, there's so many new families coming, so many kids coming. We're in desperate need of people like you to make a difference in their lives. You might be thinking that you don't have what that takes, you're not sure if you have the time. I just want to encourage you, we'll provide the training, we'll provide all that you need. All you need is a willing heart uh, to come and make a difference, and God will use you to invest the next generation. Now more than ever, this generation that's growing up in the church needs people, people like you, to invest in them, to care for them, to love them, to teach them about the truth of God's Word and God's love through Jesus. So yeah, we'll provide all the training, curriculum, all the resources that, that you need to serve in whatever role that you can fill. In the lobby, we have a display set up with openings that we currently have, and we'd love to help you find a spot that's just right for you. We invite you to say yes. Say yes. Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, it's good to be here with all of you. My name is Sterling. If I don't know you, I'm a campus pastor at our Mill Creek campus, uh, but it's good to be over here at Kesslinger uh, with all of you this morning. And if I could just add my encouragement to what Pastor Jeff and uh, Becky just shared with us is uh, most of my career here at Chapel Street in the world of student ministries. And one of the privileges that I had during that time is the opportunity to baptize our students. And sometimes we were in Ecuador or Mexico and other places on mission trips and kids would, would choose to be baptized and we'd circle the students up and they would share their testimonies in time after time after time students in high school who are taking the step to publicly identify themselves with Jesus in baptism, doing that in front of their peers, as they told their story, would talk about some Sunday school teacher who loved on them and some adventure club leader who helped their minds experience the truth of the gospel to help them understand that for the very first time in a very real and personal way. They talked about all the ways that people had invested in them and helped them grow in, in their relationship with Jesus. And now they found themselves in this place, in this moment, there wanting to identify themselves with Jesus in front of their peers. I know that for a lot of us, there's a lot that we have going on in our hearts and our lives. But from a ministry perspective, when we think about the church, in so many ways, we think about children's ministries as the front lines of the work. Like, we have to get this right. And so if you are here this morning and there's even a small part of you that's just asking, I wonder if I would be able to do this or if there's a spot that I could fill, whether it's in Buddy Break or Adventure Club on Wednesday night, uh, whether it's with our Sunday morning program here uh, at Kesslinger or one of our other three campuses, can I invite you to go out to the lobby following the service and just get more information? Uh, you're not committing to anything. They would love to chat with you, maybe tell you about the opportunities that exists and give you some time to think and pray about it. But we would love to have your help and you are investing in something of eternal value uh, when you spend time with these kids. And we're so grateful uh, for so many of you that, that do. Let's pray together and, and we'll open up God's word. Father, we just thank you for this day. 
We thank you for the opportunity to gather as a community to, um, to hear, again, stories of the work that you're doing in and through the church, the way you're drawing people to yourself. And we're grateful, Lord. Our, our, we praise you for it. Um, Lord, continue to rise up the, the people to, um, to serve kids, to serve in men's and women's ministries and shepherds' hearts all throughout the church with our students, Lord, people to lead D groups and access groups, all of that. Lord, would you meet the need? Jesus, as we come into your word, Holy Spirit, would you speak? Settle our hearts and our minds that we might receive from you. That's in your name we pray, amen. Well, throughout this summer, if you have been here with us, we've, we've been exploring this idea of what it means to live by faith. What, is, what does it mean for us as followers of Jesus to operate out of a posture of faith? And we've been looking at these examples that are cited in Hebrews in, uh, chapter 11 of men and women from the Old Testament whose faith in the promise of God, or, or perhaps said more accurate, their faith in the God of the promise actually produces in them this, this confident action, this, this, this faith that, that presents itself in faithful obedience, even in many times when the resolution of that promise, the experience of it is far outside of their reach far outside of, of anything that they can see immediately in front of them. They they've live and believe in, in the God of the promise. The author of Hebrews begins his chapter in chapter 11 by defining faith by saying, it's confidence in what we hope for, assurance of what we do not see. That's from the NIV. That's, that's how that translation words it. It's it's the translation that I first came across this definition and began to understand what faith looks like. We've talked about it kind of on the, uh, the, where the rubber meets the road and, and sort of layman's terms, if you will. We've talked about it as a way of the, that faith means to live and to act in the confidence that God is telling us the truth. To live and to act knowing, aware of, and faith in that God is, is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do. One of the challenges, however, that we face when it comes to living in faith is when the experience of God's faithfulness in our lives, that he, that he is who he says he is and that he'll do what he said he'll do, doesn't match sort of our expectations or assumptions about what that's going to look like, if you've ever been there. So what we do to kind of mitigate that, if you're anything like me anyways, we kind of do the like, dip a toe in thing, right? Like, um, I'm gonna test the waters out a little bit. And so maybe like you were here and you've heard us talk before about how we wanna be a chapel on our street. We wanna love our neighbors. We feel like that's the call of the God in their life. And maybe you've reached out and, and started to try to build genuine relationships with your neighbors only to be rejected, right? You want to love your neighbors. Your neighbors are not interested in being loved by you. And so we can kind of like, pull back, right? We can kind of be like, well, I, I gave that a shot. I, I tried, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to withdraw, or may, maybe you've experienced this in, in the confines or in terms of generosity. So I, wanna, I want God to grow my heart in generosity. I want to I I be able to help support those who are in need, or the work of the church, the kingdom of God as a whole. And, and so I'm looking at kind of the whole big picture financially, and I'm, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to set aside this money. I'm going to give this money, and I I do it, and then an unexpected bill comes in. Or all of a sudden the car is in the shop and you're kind of thinking like, okay, I need to, I gotta, I gotta pull this. This didn't, this expression of faith in Jesus didn't really work out for me. I need to play it safe. I mention this because I think that this might be the mindset of Moses about halfway through his life. This, this might kind of capture where we find him, because if you remember back in Hebrews chapter 11, we looked at these verses last week. It says in verse 24, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. So by faith, Moses aligns himself with the people of God. 
He, he, he begins to defend the oppressed. He wants to advocate for justice, even at, at great personal cost, which it cites here. He, he grew up in Pharaoh's household. All the uh, authority and power and excess, all that available to him to leave that behind and to go align himself with God's people. He's, he's stepping out in faith. But in his effort to do so, and some of you may know this story, he sees a moment when, when one of his Jewish, Hebrew, Israelite brothers and sisters is being beaten by an Egyptian. He steps in to, to intervene, and when he, when he comes to the defense of, of this Hebrew slave, he ends up killing the Egyptian. In order to kind of cover things up, he actually hides the body, and for a moment, he thinks he's gotten away with it. But there were witnesses, and they call him out on it, and eventually the report of, of this murder goes all the way up to Pharaoh. And in Exodus chapter 2, verse 15, it says, when Pharaoh heard about this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian, and sat down by a well. But faith, living this out, didn't really work out for Moses. He tried to advocate. He, he tried to defend, clearly imperfectly. But he ends up fleeing for his life. And so in the middle of this story of Moses' life, we find him living in Midian. He's married now. He's settled there. He's working for his father-in-law. He's made a, a nice little life for himself. But this isn't all that, that Hebrews tells us about Moses, and it's certainly not the end of his story. So if we pick things up in verse 27 now. Hebrews 11, verse 27. By faith, he left Egypt behind. Not being afraid of the king's anger, for Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. By faith, he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. And by faith, they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry land. When the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned. So the author of Hebrews now, in this second portion of, of Moses' life, he cites three specific events that are marked by faith in the life of Moses, but really three major events in, in the overarching story of God and the way that he is going to work out his redemptive plan for all people. The Exodus, the Passover, and then the crossing of the Red Sea. And in each of these instances, each of these examples, Moses demonstrates faith in the face of, of opposition. There's a very tangible thing that is opposing him, that's coming against him. And Moses' response is to live by faith. And that's what I want us to explore together today. Just by way of, of disclaimer here, these events that we're looking at, these three events, these account for 15 or so chapters in Exodus. Uh, there's volumes written about the significance of these events and countless sermons preached. And so we are in not doing a deep dive into the events themselves, but really looking at, I think, what is the purpose of the author of Hebrews as he cites these events and how that, how that um, teaches us, instructs us as it relates to our own experience, our own development of, of a resilient and overcoming faith. A faith that's, that's asked more of us than sort of dipping a toe in, but, but sort of diving in the deep end, if you will. Let's begin by looking at faith in the face of power. Faith in the face of power. Notice back in verse 27, event number one, that they cite, by faith, he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger. For Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. I don't know if you've ever found yourself in circumstances or a situation where you're in the room with or, or uh, in a relationship with somebody where there is a clear gap in ability or power. 
right? It, it's very um, disconcerting if you've ever been in that place. When I was in high school, uh, I, I played high school basketball, um, but I was, I was just good enough to be on the team, but not nearly good enough for the coach to put me in an actual physical game, right? Like, I had my spot pretty well reserved down somewhere near the, the water jug. And, um, and, but my friend and I, we would go out, um, and I grew up in Dayton, Ohio, and we would go out to area high schools and, and participate in open gyms. And we'd get a team together, and the way this works, you'd come with a team, and, and when a court opened up, you would play the team that was on the court. If you won, you stayed. If you lost, you kind of got back in line and waited for for the game to go forward. So it was our turn, we step out on the court. Everybody kind of just sort of lines up defensively. You're, you're thinking like, who's about my size and, and that sort of stuff. So I line up and I kind of look across the guy on the other side of the court from me and he's the number one ranked player in the city of Dayton, Ohio. He's already signed a division one contract to play for the University of Dayton. And so the game begins, I'm not gonna lie, I started off okay. Like, it was like he wasn't scoring a bunch of points. I was, like, defending him, doing my thing, you know. And, and then we were on offense. There was a loose ball, and it got tossed down the court. He goes flying past me down the court, grabs the ball, and just does this, like, thunderous dunk on me. And I just kind of, like, shrank into, like, my spot. From there, that point on, essentially, the game was over, right? Because there was this clear gap between where I was at as related to my ability, my power, if you will, and where he was at. See, the book of Moses, or the uh, book of Moses, the book of Exodus has Moses, at this point in time in the story, he's fled from Egypt fearing for his life. He's living as a shepherd in the desert in Midian. And now God has called him to return to Egypt to confront the most powerful man in the world. Imagine that experience. Um, imagine the power gap that you would fill, uh, fill when you walked into that room. In fact, it's really a, a type of power that you and I can hardly even wrap our heads around because there was essentially no checks and balances on the power that, that Pharaoh wielded. But not only that, not only does God send him to confront Pharaoh, but he's also sent to deliver the news that God is going to free the Hebrew people, the, the, the people that Pharaoh has enslaved, this labor force that he, has, that he has oppressed, and he's going to lead them out of Egypt. Like imagine being called to, add, to, to deliver that news. And, and where, from where does Moses get the confidence to be able to do that? From where does, what is empowering his faith? Notice again, it says, not being afraid of the king's anger. But Moses was afraid of the king's anger. That's why he fled Egypt in the first place. For Moses, uh, Moses um, I just lost my place. He preserved as one who sees him who is invisible. Real things happen here, people. <laughs> he perceives the God of the invisible. We, Moses understands there is a power gap, but it isn't between himself and Pharaoh, or it is, but that is irrelevant. It's between Pharaoh and Yahweh, and Pharaoh is on the wrong side of this power gap. And so let's turn back to the book of Exodus, to the encounter that Moses has with Yahweh, to the encounter that is informing his faith, and you know this story as, as the burning bush encounter. Moses is, is doing his thing as a shepherd, living out in the fields. He's taking care of the sheep, and he comes across this shrub in the middle of the desert that's on fire. But it isn't being consumed. And so out of curiosity, he approaches it, and out of this shrub, the voice of God speaks, and he says, Moses, you're on holy ground. Take off your shoes because you're in the presence of, of God himself. And Moses responds, this is Exodus chapter three, picking it up in verse seven now. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt and I've heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their suffering and I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
the territory of the Canaanites and Hethites, Amorites, Pezrites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And so, and so, because the Israelites' cry for help has come to me, and I have also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them, therefore go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now look down in verse 13. Then Moses asked of God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? What should I tell them? God replies to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites. And, and here he, again, he's restating the promise. He's coming back to them. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. Again, here, there's, there's so much that we could unpack here. There's so much that is unfolding in this narrative, but I want to just highlight real quickly two things that I think are instrumental in, in Moses' expression of faith. They're critical elements, and that is the call of God, right? But it's the call of God that comes from a personal encounter with God. It's God saying, I am sending you, Moses. This is my plan. This is how I'm going to work this out. I'm placing this call in your heart and your life. But I am the God who is the I am. And so God here doesn't refer to himself in, in the terms of a title. He doesn't use like Elohim, which, which is translated as God, kind of like um, if you think about people, like if you were to call me, some people do this, and this is kind of a Midwest thing where you'll, you'll say, oh, hey, pastor. Like you'll, you'll refer to me in terms of, of a title, but if we're hanging out like on a Friday night getting dinner, right? Uh, call me, call me Sterling. You can call me Sterling anytime, but like you, you would, there's relationship there, right? You would use my name. This is the significance of what's happening here. See, the conflict that Moses finds himself at the center of here in, in the book of Exodus is the same conflict that's been raging all the way on since Genesis chapter three. It is the kingdom of this world that's, that's depicted in, in Pharaoh and all his authority and the power and the strength of his armies, his kingdom, his claim, by the way, to, to be deity incarnate. Pharaoh, the people of Egypt believed that Pharaoh himself was God in, in human flesh. And this kingdom in opposition to the kingdom of God, what God had created and designed and how he desires for us to live and to operate, it's the same battle that rages on today. If you know the story of, of Exodus, you know that Moses does not immediately respond like in willing obedience to God's call. In fact, he deals with doubt and insecurity, and really just a desire that God's call would be passed on to somebody else. But God is persistent, and he's clear, and he sends Moses to confront the abuses and the oppression and, and the injustice of Pharaoh. And Moses goes in faith. He goes in faith to confront the most powerful man leading the most powerful nation on earth because he has an encounter with the God whose very name is going to be associated with the liberation of his people. He said, this is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. If you're anything like me, oftentimes I, I, I think to myself, if I had an experience like Moses, if I, if I had something where that was that powerful, that transformative, then I could live with the type of faith that Moses demonstrates here. But I think that the author of Hebrews, I think the point that he's making with the people of God is that in our very salvation, we have a transformative, powerful encounter with the God who liberates, the God who sets us free, and we know his name. Jesus said to his disciples, he says to all of us, I'm sending you. I'm sending you to be my agents, my, my representatives into this world. 
Beyond that, he's left us with the Holy Spirit to empower and inform our faith. Faith in in the face of of power is found in the call of God that, that is experienced in a personal encounter with him. And I think the author of Hebrews is saying we have both of these in Jesus. If you're here as a follower of Jesus, both of those things are true. And there is a power gap. The apostle John says that that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Moses goes in faith. But we also see this exemplified in, in faith in the face of judgment. Faith in the face of judgment, the second event that's cited in in Hebrews chapter 11 is that of the Passover. This is verse 28 now. He says, by faith he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. I don't know if you've ever found yourself in a situation where you are facing impending judgment. When I was in high school, I I, uh, got into a car accident and had to go to traffic court. Uh, I was on a date, and that relationship uh, did not continue after that. And and so I'm standing there in front of the judge, and I I knew that I was guilty, and they asked, like, how do you plead? And so I said, I said, guilty. And then there was this moment between my declaration of guilt and the thing that she said next that felt like an eternity. Because I knew there was, judgment was about to be rendered. And I knew that there was nowhere I could go to escape it. Like I had to face it head on. And I knew I understood sort of like, in my mind I understood I'm not going to be hauled off to jail or something like that. But the, the, the fear and the uncertainty of that judgment and that desire, where do I go? How do you get out from underneath this? As you've probably guessed, when when Moses goes to confront Pharaoh, Pharaoh uh, was resistant, as we should say. In fact, there's this this powerful juxtaposition about the faith that Moses goes in as a result of this encounter with Yahweh at the burning bush and Pharaoh's response to Moses. This is in in Exodus chapter 5. Pharaoh says to Moses, as he responded, who is the Lord that I should obey him by letting Israel go. I don't know the Lord, and besides, I will not let him go. So Moses is saying, I am here on on, uh, assignment from the God whose name is going to be associated with liberating, freeing his people. And Pharaoh's like, I don't know this God. In fact, I, I see myself as God, and so I'm not gonna do that. But God is faithful. And he's true to his promise. He told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. A series of plagues are brought on Egypt as divine judgment. With them, an opportunity for Pharaoh to relent, to repent and and to follow in obedience, to let the people be set free. But in every instance, he refuses. It escalates from there. It builds to one final act of judgment. God says that the firstborn in every house throughout all of Egypt is going to die as a result of of, of Pharaoh's disobedience, the firstborn son. But God, just as he did for Noah, will provide a way out. He provides salvation from, from judgment. Moses instructs the people of Israel to set aside an unblemished lamb for sacrifice. And he instructs the people to take the blood of that lamb once it's been sacrificed and they are to to paint it on the doorposts of their homes. And this might sound to us to be so um, odd and unfamiliar. But there's something significant that's happening here. If you turn to Exodus chapter 12, in verse 12. These are the instructions given to the people. He says, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both people and animals. I am the Lord, and I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. There's there's a whole thing here that's unfolding in these plagues where, where Egypt has escalated different aspects of their culture and their society and claimed them to be God, and God is dismantling them one at a time. 
And the blood on the houses where you are staying, hear this, will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Right? In other words, he's saying, I, I am going to give you a way out. I'm going to provide for you a mediator, one who's going to bear the weight and the penalty of the judgment. But you as the people, you have to place your faith in the covering of the sacrificial lamb. The point that the author of Hebrews is making here for us is that it's the covering of the blood. It's, it's the provision, God's provision from out from underneath judgment. It's accessed, it's, it's applied to us by faith, right? It's living and it's acting in the awareness that God is telling us the truth. And, and Hebrews has already pointed us to the fact that this, is, this has all been about Jesus, if we had time today, we would flip over just a couple pages to Hebrews chapter 10, where it describes for us the way Jesus has become the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. All this that's unfolding there, the, the impact of Passover, it's applied to us when we place our faith in Jesus. Right? What option do we have? What is available to us in the face of impending judgment? It's to trust to put our faith in, in the sacrifice. God provides a covering from judgment. Have you placed your faith in him? Then thirdly, we see faith in the face of the impossible. Faith in the face of the impossible. Again, back in, in Hebrews, verse 29. It says, by faith, they crossed the Red Sea as those who were on dry land. When the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned. Right? I don't want to allegorize this. I don't, I don't want to turn this into some like metaphor about overcoming obstacles because I don't think that's the intent of the author of Hebrews. In fact, I think there's a very real application to our faith. Moses, after some early reluctance, he, he acts in faith and he confronts the power of Pharaoh, he confronts this kingdom of this world. Right? By faith, he tells the people of Israel to, to paint on their doorposts the blood of the sacrificial lamb and that, that this will provide um, security from God's judgment that's coming. But after all of that, the people of Israel are, are freed from Egypt. They make their way out and they find themselves trapped between the Red Sea and the impending army of Pharaoh that's coming to destroy them, right? It's, it's their act of faith. It's their, Moses' leadership that's now placed them face to face with the impossible. And this is from Exodus chapter 14. This is where they find themselves in verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were Egyptians coming after them. The Israelites were terrified and cried out to the Lord for help. They said to Moses, it is, because there, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we were told in Egypt? Leave us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Verse 13, but Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord's salvation that he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you must be quiet. And the NIV says, be still and watch the Lord fight for you. See, biblical faith is, isn't wishful thinking. It isn't trying to believe something enough to produce a desired result in us. Biblical faith is obedience even in the face of the impossible. It's faithfulness when, when for you and I, we look around us and we see no clear path forward. When we look around us and we understand the things that we're facing are far outside of our control. Biblical faith sometimes in our lives looks like being quiet 
being still and watching the Lord fight for us. I was working on this sermon on, on Friday morning and finishing things up and thinking through this. And, and then Friday afternoon, I had the opportunity to visit my friends, Matt and Jenny Caterer. And, and um, I hadn't seen Jenny since she had had her stem cell research. If you don't know Matt and Jenny, Jenny has worked here at Chapel Street for years. In fact, we both started about the same time 15 years ago. Um, she was the executive assistant to Pastor Jeff, and um, about eight months ago, she gave birth to a beautiful little baby girl, and then eight weeks after that, found out that she had an aggressive uh, form of cancer. Um, the cancer grew on her spine, and as a result, she, she required surgery and was left paralyzed. Um, so I knock on the door on, on Friday, and the door swings open, and Jenny's standing there walking around her living room. And I, I was moved to tears just seeing her like this. We sat down and we talked and caught up and, and we cried and prayed and laughed and told stories and, and watched Kylie play and, and, and it was fantastic. But we started to talk about this passage and we started to talk about what that looks like and the experience of it. And she started to share stories of how God is working and moving and how her and Matt had this like, okay, Lord, we don't know why we're here. This is not the plan that we had for ourselves. This is not what we desired for ourselves, but we are here. And we don't know how to move forward. And she said, in every instance of pain and suffering, sorrow and grief, she said, we have seen God do something redemptive and restorative every single time. She says, this is not... We don't have some clear path forward. We don't, we don't look, in fact, from a human perspective, you would look at it and you'd say, this is impossible. There is no path forward. She says, all we can do is sit and watch the Lord fight for us and trust whatever plan that he has for us is good. And she says, giving glory to God. The author of Hebrews is writing this letter to a group of, of followers of Jesus who are suffering, facing intense persecution, even death. Many of them are most likely asking themselves how to find a way that provides relief from their persecution, but also allows them to continue following Jesus in obedience, and they see no clear path forward. But they are reminded of the faith of Moses. They are reminded, too, that they can, in faith, stand firm and see the Lord's salvation that he will accomplish today. Sometimes you don't have anything left. Be still. Be quiet. Watch the Lord fight for you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you again for the example of Moses and all these examples of people who have lived out their faith for you in very practical and, and, and tangible ways. And Lord, call us to do the same. That when faced with obstacle, when faced with opposition, that we, would, that we would follow you in obedience. That we would step out knowing that you are the God who, who has placed a call in our lives and that has transformed us in a personal encounter with you. Help us to live this out. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. This morning as we respond, I, I want to invite us to come together to the Lord's table. If you didn't receive the communion elements as you walked in today, just raise your hand and one of our ushers will find you and they'll make sure they'll offer these to you this morning as we come to the Lord's table. If you're here and you're new with us, know that this is not a, a Chapel Street thing. It's not the table of Chapel Street. This is the, the table of our Lord Jesus Christ and he invites us. And so if you're in a relationship with him, if you've trusted him for forgiveness, we invite you this morning to come to the table. As Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room on that particular evening, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this bread is my body that I will give for you. This is going to be the means that he would be our sacrificial lamb in which we place our faith in the face of judgment. As you take this bread, be reminded of the body of Christ given for you, take and eat in remembrance of him. And then Jesus said, take this cup. 
Because this cup is my blood and it is the blood of a new covenant that has been shed for the forgiveness of sins. As you take this blood, again, remember the redemption, the doorpost, the sprinkling of the blood that is available to us under which we are declared clean, new creations. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink in remembrance of him. Amen. You've now received this morning's benediction. Go in the name of Jesus Christ, in whom and through whom we have had a powerful, transformative encounter that sends us into this world to represent you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.